Robin and Tina, I haven't forgot we were going to do that at the end of the service, if that's all right. I kind of got carried away here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless God, is it hot in here? Yeah. I'd hate to be the only one. So if I'm going to talk to somebody, go ahead and call 911. You know, we got all these spiritual people think if I pass out, it's in the spirit. If you see me fall out, you call 911. You pray over me while they're on their way. But you know. I will leave it. I'll motion to you if it's a spirit. You know, that's what good to I'm getting ready to get slain. <laughs> God is so good, amen? amen. But it'd be alright with you if I take my jacket off. Yes. I'm off the hog. I'm a little bit nervous because these pants used to barely fit. God is good. I would like to talk to you for a few moments today. I won't keep you too long, maybe. About who you really are, in case you don't know. And, uh, if you have your Bible, turn over to Ephesians chapter 3. And while you're doing that, I want to uh, ask you to be aware. We have several people that are out uh, for Amy and Rebecca on their honeymoon. The, uh, I don't think they need to be except for safe travel back. I think they got everything else under control. And uh, then... Uh, uh, Connie and Brenda are home packing this weekend because they're moving back to Tulsa on Friday, so they will be back with us on a permanent basis, so we're excited about that. And uh, be praying for Tammy and Marley as they will be on their way back. Tammy, for those of you who think we never sent ministry out, you are wrong. Uh, Tammy was ministering at New Covenant in Atlanta, uh, representing diversity this weekend, and so we want to uh, pray for them as they're on their way back. God's done some great things, amen? amen. And of course, Penny and Stur and uh, Tara and Randy are in uh, New Mexico. We'll be headed back. Stur's father passed away and they've been at his funeral, but they are headed back home in the morning, I believe. So remember, they went in prayer. Uh, they're both weird drivers, and so you just be, be praying for them. But, you know, Penny learned to drive from all. And so. <laughs> And everybody who stands in the parking lot knows how to clear out that place. So, don't worry. Her brakes got fixed last year, so the church has not been having to pray as much. Are you in Ephesians in chapter 3? Starting at verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye be rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the bread, and the length, and the depth, and the height. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with the fullness of God. That you might be filled with the fullness of God. I want you to understand that God does not want to sprinkle out on you. God does not want to put a little bit in your cup. He wants you to be overflowing. He wants you to be filled. Say filled. He wants you to be filled with the fullness of God. And if we're to be filled with the fullness of God, we have to empty ourselves out because we can't be full of ourselves and full of God. Amen. Amen? Amen? Now preach with me today. And so, a whole lot of times we've got our own ideas of what we think church should be. We've got our own ideas of what we think we should be. And furthermore, we've got ideas of what we think everybody else should be. And what we're learning is that God is changing our our comprehension of, of how things should be. And God is making the church so mixed up that the old church will never recognize what the new church is becoming. Right. But the new church is becoming literally what God designed it to be. But I want you to understand, we've been preaching this for weeks and weeks. I want you to understand that this building is not a church. This building is made of bricks and mortar and wood and drywall and all kinds of other stuff we don't even want to know is in the ceiling. <laughs> So it's just a building. You are the church. The body says you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. When Jesus looked at Peter, Peter said, Thou art the rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so we are the church. We are the church that comes together and meets in a building. But if we are not careful, we would define ourselves by what people have always said we should be, and not necessarily act like we should be. And so in this, I want you to focus on, on this last part. Well, first of all, on the, on the first part, that you might be rooted and grounded in love. Why? Because love covers a multitude of sins. 
How many of you know when you're really loved and loved, you can love people you disagree with? You can love people who treat you bad. You can love people who stab you in the back. You can love people who, who treat you good. And then when you're rooted and grounded in love, that means, let, let me explain this to you. What it doesn't say is that you are rooted and grounded in emotions. Now, Pentecostal charismatic people, we're emotional people. I mean, we'll cry at the drop of a handkerchief. Literally. I'll let four handkerchiefs. <laughs> we're all about the most unimportant things and we'll shout over a fruit fly so we're often moved by emotion and that's right if God was emotional in case you don't know look at the verses when they talk about Jesus I believe Jesus was an emotional as a matter of fact you inherited your emotions from your heavenly father you may not know that but how you use them is what counts and so it says we're rooted and grounded in love. And so it means that I can love you even when I disagree with you. Because if I can't love you then, I'm defining who I am, not who God is. And I'm saying, well, I don't like that. Well, how many of you know there are a whole lot of things in life you're not going to like? And we live in a world in a day and an age where people like to run rather than deal with issues. As a matter of fact, people, you know, kids drop out of school. Most of the time because they don't want to have to deal with what's going on there because there's so much crazy stuff going on in the schools. It's been like that for years. It's worse now than it's ever been. But ever, I mean, it was like that whenever I was a kid. And that was a long time ago. People run from relationships because they don't want to deal with the relationship. People run from churches because they don't want to be submitted. People run because they don't recognize that the fullness of God is not about denomination. It's not about the name on the door. It's not about all this... You ask for a moment because I'm getting ready to give it to you. You need to define who you are and, the, and become content with who you are and quit trying to act like everybody else and everything else and trying to make other people like you that ain't never going to like you anyhow. Make other people love you that ain't going to love you. Think that if you do the right thing, everybody will stick around and you'll do all this. Honey, those that are with you can leave and those that are against you won't be able to stay. You've got to decide what you're going to do and define who you are and not worry about what anybody else does. Amen. You've got to decide in your own life, am I going to serve God or am I not going to serve God? As a matter of fact, the biggest thing I want you to get out of this whole sermon is that your identity is that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Yes, you are not even diversity Christian fellowship. That's the name of the, of the church where you attend. But you are not defined by that. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Yes. And not everybody is called here. Not everybody can take this. That's Decide who you are. Define yourself. I'm, as a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you today, redefine yourself. And so then he says, if you're really grown up, that you may be able to comprehend with all the things. Now wait just a moment. If you, comprehend, if you can only comprehend with the things that you agree with, you can't comprehend with all the things. Good preaching, Pastor. Well, thank you. The breadth and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ one person says, which passes all understanding. In other words, no matter how I try to understand that, I can't understand the love of God. I can't understand how, you know, I can understand how God can love me because I'm a lovable person, but I can't understand how He loves some of you. And he says that you might be filled, overflowing with the fullness of God. Yes. How many of you know when you're overfilled and overflowing with the fullness of God, you no longer act by yourself. You no longer go by your agenda. You go by God's agenda. Yes. And it don't matter if everybody else has. As a matter of fact, I, often I left my book back there on my desk. Would you run and get it for me? It sure is good to have kids. Good kids. <laughs> Most of the time. Now while he's out of the room. <laughs> For those of you who commented and liked and enjoyed those things he put on Facebook. <laughs> you are on my list also. I keep track of who likes what. <laughs> Thank you honey. We didn't talk about you while you were gone. 
For those of you who are on my Facebook, lost later tonight, there will be some great pictures coming up. Oh. <laughs> and don't believe anything he puts out. He now has Photoshop and he makes up photos that don't really exist. <laughs> Thanks, Shannon, for encouraging me. This has become one of my favorite books other than the Bible lately. It's called List to Live By. I've been sharing some of this with you from time to time. It says, this is what the world needs. The world needs people who cannot be bought. Whose word is their bond. And who puts character above wealth. Who possesses opinions and a will. Who are larger than their vocations. And who do not hesitate to take chances. Who will not lose their individuality in a crowd. Who will be as honest in the small things as they are in the great things. Who will make no compromise with wrong. Whose ambitions are not confined to their own selfish desires. Who will not say they do it because everybody else does it. Who are true to their friends through good report and evil report in adversity as well as prosperity. Who do not believe that shrewdness, cunning, and hard-headedness are the best qualities for winning success. And who are not ashamed or afraid to stand for the truth, even when it's unpopular. Right. Who can say no with emphasis, although the rest of the world says yes. Those are what the world needs more of. And it just happened to go with what I was preaching as I was reading that last night. And so that you might be filled with the fullness of God. And so I made out a list of scriptures that might define you. First Corinthians chapter 15 verse 49 says that you are beautiful in your glory. How many of you know that you have been crowned with glory because God crowned you with glory? So don't, now we give the glory to God, but you've been crowned with glory and honor and power because you are, again, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Acts chapter 2 and verse 17 says that though the fowl may wait and die, the root still see, will still seek nourishment and grow. So I don't want you to be defined by what might be happening to the outside. You know, some of us expand, some of us contract. I was trying to think what the other word is. Don't be defined by that because you have roots that go deeper than your looks. Thank you. You need to remember that you've got roots that go deeper than your looks. I don't know about you, but some mornings that's a great comfort to me. Oh, <laughs> Hallelujah. John 3.31 says, Do not seek what you can see because it will fade. Seek instead what can be brought to bloom. Look at what the things in your life that can expand. There are some things that you tried and you didn't make it. That's all right. You will never know what you can't do until you at least try it. But you've got to try something. But you know what? Don't be defined by your failures. As a matter of fact, don't even be defined by your successes. Be defined by who you are in Christ. Yes. John 13, verse 34 through 35 says that you love as greatly as I love you. So you need to define yourself as one who loves. One who loves. Have you ever, as a matter of fact, here's a, here's a great opportunity for you to do. Have you ever dealt with people that were hard to love? Do you have friends or relatives that you can love as long as you don't have to see them? Yes. <laughs> Distance makes the heart grow fonder. Yes. <laughs> you know that whenever you hear somebody says something about a family reunion and your stomach starts to turn and you start to... <laughs> But we've got to love. And that's part of our definition. Now, Psalms in chapter 128 and verse 5 says that your life on earth is just a stepping stone. Mm. Now, I don't want us to get on this sweet by my mentality that we can't have great things down here, but I want you to understand there's an old song that says, The things of earth will live and lose their values if we recall their borrowed for a while. So you've got to understand that this life is just a stepping stone. In the face of eternity, this life is as a grain of sand in the ocean. And so we are looking not on 
the Bible says we focus not on what is unseen or what is seen, for what is seen is temporary, but we focus on what is unseen, for what is unseen is eternal. I want you to get that because that's why I can stand beside the grave side of someone that I love and know that this is a temporary departure, that one of these days things are going to be brought back together. That why when things in life happen, we can stand with all our strength of knowing that God is going to be faithful to complete what He started in us. And this life is just a momentary speck in a time of what God is going to do in the face of eternity. And I'm, I'm happy with my life here. I want you to understand that. I have hope. I have joy. I have peace. I have righteousness. I can name all the fruits of the Spirit because I'm a freely person. But I... I, <laughs> I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> You ever get some of those things that you think you just think and then you notice you said it out loud? <laughs> I like all those things and, and, and I, God is blessing me and blessing me and blessing me. I, I'm so blessed I can hardly take it. But I will tell you this, I believe that the hope of the church is still that Jesus Christ was buried and on the third day he rose again from the dead and the Bible says in, in Thessalonians that one of these days in a moment in the twinkling of an eye the trumpet of God shall sound and the dead in Christ shall be raised and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet him in the air and then he says something you know what to do with it therefore comfort one another with these words that's why we need to talk about the fact that yes Jesus is coming back yes I want to reach everybody but I will not allow this church to compromise the name of Jesus. I will not allow us to compromise the blood of Jesus. I will not us allow, allow us to comprehend and say, oh, it doesn't matter what you believe. Honey, it does matter what you believe. It starts in Genesis and it ends in Revelation. And you need to get this word of God in your life because it will change you. And that's why when the moment comes and Jesus comes back, you're not trying to say, well, I hope I got it all right. Every time you see a crack in the eastern skies, you get a Britney Spear or something, and oops, I did it again. <laughs> I know y'all didn't think I knew those songs. I know more than you think I know. If I think you don't think I know all that, you should pray. <laughs> now, so we established that first of all, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Second thing I want you to understand, you are not defeated. Don't go around with this defeated mentality of, oh, if I can just get through today. Can I tell you, that stuff will kill you. When you start going around, oh, I, I can remember growing up in the church, it was the most depressing place to go. Because people would stand up and then testimony services Lord, just help me hold out to the end. Lord, I, I've heard people to pray for somebody to get saved and then they die so they know they went to heaven. Oh, so they were convinced God would save them, just not convinced God would keep them. I've heard testimony, sir. As a matter of fact, I went to preach in the church. I'm not going to say how long ago, ago it was, but I haven't traveled much in the last few years. Then you'll be narrowing it down to how many places I've gone, so I won't tell you where it was. But I went to this one church and preached. And so before, but before they, they had a list of things that they go through, they had some rituals that they go through before anything happens. And, uh, and sometimes then nothing happens. And, but they decided to have a testimony and a prayer request before service, or before I got to preach. And for me it was a great testimony service. And for the first part. But in the second part, I felt myself getting depressed. We need to pray for Sister back up. Because she's at home with a callus on her foot. She couldn't make it to church today. And we need to pray for Brother Ball. Because he couldn't see his way to get to church. We need to pray for... I mean, they, they had a list 
of every bad thing that can happen to anybody. And they've gone through it right before I preached. And by the time I got up for preaching, I wanted to say, you know, I think this world's going to hell on a handbasket. Let's just go home. I didn't even have any encouragement in myself. There is this mentality in the church that says, in order to be a Christian, I have to just get by. I have to just live. It's just one day at a time. Sweet Jesus. <laughs> if you all play that at my funeral, I will come back. You will never have a good night's sleep again. <laughs> Make sure those bones weren't close from your front door, baby. <laughs> now, but I want you to understand, we can, get, we can easily adapt this thing because talking about heaven, heaven is great, but then we can also get this comprehension in our minds that we've just got to make it through. You know, hey, won't you play another Somebody done somebody wrong song and make me feel at home. <laughs> While I miss my face. <laughs> Often I thought that should be the theme of the church because everybody comes in talking about who did what wrong and who did a bad and why they I don't come to church because so and so goes to church there. Well, you're going you don't plan on what they have me because they may make it there. Can you imagine how surprised Jerry Falwell is going to be to see my face? As a matter of fact, I put a request in to God, I'm going to live next door to Pat Roberts. Because, girl, I think I get to heaven, not only do I have a friend, I got a gown that is going to outshine him. Now be careful because now you're trying to define who I am. And so what I want you to do is also define yourself as more than a conqueror. You are not just getting through. You are more than a conqueror. You are healed. You are restored. You are redeemed. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. If he, how many of you believe that God is a conqueror? Okay, Jesus said whenever he went away that not that you would be greater. Somebody misquoted that on Facebook here all back. Not that you would be greater than him. That is not true. But he said you would do greater things than what he did because he was going to the Father for you. So if Jesus spoke to Lazarus and called him to come out of that grave, if Jesus healed a blind man, if Jesus met the woman at the well, and you could do greater things than that, why would you go around saying, I just got to get through? You are more than a copper. There are greater things on the inside of you than what you understand. And you will never understand it until you start to exercise it. And you're going to have to speak it. And you're going to have to believe it. And I want you to understand, I don't want you to be defined anymore by your family, of who you came from, or who your children are. Just because Maybe your family always had issues. It doesn't mean you're going to have issues. Maybe your family was always broke. It don't mean you're always going to be broke. Maybe there was no illness that ran in your family. Honey, maybe it could stop with you. Yes. Somebody says, we don't suffer from mental illness in our family. We enjoy it. Don't be defined by your family. Don't be defined, be defined by what your family has said about you. The biggest thing that I deal with in young people and sometimes even in older people is what somebody said over them. You need to break the generational curses of what people have said about you and over you. And, and maybe they said you would never amount to anything. Maybe they said you were always going to be poor because that was your family's tradition. Maybe they said you were always going to be trash. Maybe they said you'd never get an education. Maybe they said you Maybe they can miss you. You could never drive a nice car. Or you could never live in a nice house. Honey, some of you ain't getting any younger. Break that thing now. Oh, Quit being defined by what people said. Yes, Quit being defined by your physique. 
Now I am in, into, well, I, I'm not going to say I'm into physical fitness because. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I can go now and still breathe. <laughs> There's a time if I've done this, I'd already been out. Now, we have a lot of people in our church that are doing a lot of physical fitness things. And that's great. And I'm not going against that, but what I am telling you is, you were just as valuable when you were heavy as you are when you are thin. And you're just as valuable thin as you are heavy. And you're just as valuable with hair as you would be without it. <laughs> Your value is not based on the clothes that you wear or how well you look wearing them. Your value is based on the inside of you. And that has been the problem with churches many times is that they have judged everybody by the way that they could dress or the way they didn't dress or what they look like. And you might be amazed at how many times Jesus is showing up as a homeless person downtown in ragged clothes and smelling. You might be surprised how many angels you might think were prostitutes that never slept with anybody but are showing up at the right place at the right time. You might be surprised. Dale Evans wrote a book called Angels Unaware. A great book. You might want to be careful about defining not only who you are, but who other people are. But quit being defined by your physical shape or the lack thereof. Quit being defined by your job. There are a whole lot of people that go through their life and their value is always based on how much money they make or their position at a company. You cannot be defined. As a matter of fact, it will be impossible. Turn to somebody and say, you can't define me. Now look at it and say, I know. <laughs> how many of you believe that you are fearfully and wonderfully made and too complicated to be defined? Amen. Don't be defined by how much money you have or how much money you don't have. And don't be defined because you go to a Pentecostal charismatic church. As a matter of fact, some of you might only think you go, we're not near as Pentecostal or charismatic as what some of you think we are. If we really ever let go, we'd scare the Jesus out of some people. I'm believing that time is coming. We're just going to rock this place, turn this place upside down. I like those kind of services. How about you? Anybody ready to have some Jesus rocking and running here in this time? But it all starts by defining who we are. And, and as a matter of fact, you know, in, in all of this, I begin to think how many times we allow friendships to define who we are. So I did some research. I went on to the web. As a matter of fact, I felt right at home there. This is from the Women's Health Magazine. Don't judge me. And this is actually from a government survey that was done uh, from the University of California's uh, Human Nutrition. Chances are you dine with a friend or had a scenario like this unfold. You start salivating over the idea of their linguine carbonara. But you tell yourself, oh, I really shouldn't. And then your friend requests the very dish before snapping the menu shut and handing it to the waiter, you say, make it two. And there goes your diet. Friends' health decisions have a funny way of rubbing off on us. So important is their power that the World Health Organization lists them as the most determination of health as the factor above genetics and income level. In fact, understanding how power shape one another, shape one another's health behavior as a top billing in the health people of 2012 in the government's plan for the national wellness being. Now, for those of you who have friends, anybody have friends who like to eat? You come to church here, you have friends who like to eat. And you can do great on your diet until you're around some of them and they start ordering some of that other stuff or they start, you know, well, just let me smell it. And it doesn't take long before you've given up and given in. And so I began to think of something so simple 
and our diet can be influenced by our friends? How could our spirit and our definition of who we are be influenced by our friends? How many of you know you need to be careful who you let allow influence? Don't let everybody scream on you. As a matter of fact, let me make this. I should have said this a long time ago, and I've had to take care of it a few times. Just because people come to church here does not mean that you should let them pray over you. God will tell you when it's okay and when it's not too to listen. But quit letting people define you. You are, I don't have to tell you this, most of you are a free spirit. Yeah. You belong to God. But you're kind of a free thinker. You kind of have to be to come to church here. You just, you don't want to put God in a box. You don't want to act like everybody else acts. And you couldn't if you tried. But don't allow yourself to be defined by what other people say, or even whenever other people approve of you or don't approve of you. You've got friends that are not going to, as a matter of fact, you've probably got friends that probably don't approve of you even coming to church here. You're going to miss them, aren't you? You've got people that are trying to define you because they want you to act like them. They want you to look like them and be like them. And that's the only way you can fit into their stuff is if you start acting like them and you want to, to be all whatever. Like them. I'm going to be careful not to define you. But I want you to understand that God says you are a peculiar people. Call forth to show the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. And so, if you wonder what God's doing right now in the church, God is not only redefining us individually, He's redefining us as a church and saying, you know what, I'm tired of the fakeness. Yes. Yes. Come on, man. And so is the pastor. I don't care how much you come in here and talk in tongues and sling snob and lay on the floor and all that. All that means is you're a good actor or actress. It don't mean you're holy. I don't care what kind of education you have or what kind of education you don't have. You're still equal in God's eyes. And He still sees you just as authoritative. And you can walk in just as much power as everyone who has Reverend, Elder, Elder Dr. Bishop behind their name all down this road. That road. That's what that is. <laughs> I get turned around in here. I want you to understand that God is moving the church into a place of realness where I, my desire is to, for us to be so defined by God that when people enter this place, there is no tension because somebody else didn't get their way about something or somebody didn't get to do this or somebody didn't get all the glory they thought or somebody wanted to do something they didn't get to do. I want it to be a place where God is lifted up and that's really the only thing that matters. And if you didn't come to lift up God and you didn't come to magnify, then you're probably not going to be comfortable here. Because this is not pastor's house. This is not your house. This is his house. And it's got to be true. And, uh, I'll scream if this thing goes out. You've got to make sure that your heart and your motives are in the right place. Amen. Don't be defined by what other people think of you or what they don't think of you. There are people that probably sit up <laughs> you too <laughs> <laughs> there are people that will try to embellish their anointing but if you pray you can see through it There are people that will try to, as a matter of fact, the, 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 the largest place that the Jezebel spirit operates is not in the world, it's not outside. The largest place that the Jezebel spirit operates is always inside the church. It is the ones that come up and say, Margarita, nobody understands you like I do. Nobody understands the burden, the pain you've been going. And so then they suck you in and they try to get close to you. And so then the first time that somebody else makes a mistake or somebody else makes a stuff, I'm the only friend you really got. There's a person that comes in and says, Rose, I know whatever, you don't know what everybody else is saying about you, but I don't believe it for an instant. You got a tattoo? (laughs) 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 
Not we know of. <laughs> I want you to understand that in order to move into what God's calling us to move in, it's going to require realness. It's going to require realness. And it means that you don't have time for the trauma and the drama and the fakeness and, uh, and all the pretty shows and all this other thing because this really is never about us, it's about Jesus. And the more that we magnify Him, He said, if I be lifted up, guess what? He'd draw people up to you. That's why the church has to be a place where people feel drawn, where they feel comfortable, where they feel loved. Not a place where we put on this big show and make everybody think that we got it all together when the reality is none of us do. And if somebody tells you they got it all together, they're lying to you. There has to be a consistency in your life to define you. And it means that the more that you allow God to move in your life, you're never the same person as what you were ten years ago. What you were five years ago. Or even what you were last year. Maybe even what you were last month. I will tell you, I'm so convinced of what God has that I won't be shaken. Because God is redefining you. How many believe God is redefining you? Changing. You know, part of redefining us is if you've raised kids, and something about when you become a parent, you equate everything to children. I don't know why that is, but it just <laughs> happens. And so, children often have attitudes. Don't be judging and critical because some of you evidently haven't grown up yet. Some of you may live with somebody that gets attitudes once in a while. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just saying. But kids, when they get attitudes, He's not going to be moved yet. When they get attitudes, when they get attitudes, when they get attitudes, all of you get them. And when they don't get their way, I know that this probably has never happened with your children, I understand that. So what would normally be a normal walk down the hallway and going into the bedroom and closing the door to watch TV? I can stomp on concrete because it will break my leg. But they'll go stomping through the house and make sure you hear that smack. To which we always say, would you like to keep that door? Wouldn't be the first time in our house we removed the door. They pop out of this. And then we begin to define them as parents. Man, as my fact, we would say, your attitude sucks. Amen? I don't like, you better get a different attitude. As a matter of fact, parents, now, now hear this so that you can don't be boss so judgmental. We're talking to our kids and say, yeah, I am tired of this attitude. I am too old for this. I'm not coming up with that attitude anymore. Do you understand me? <laughs> Oh, it hurt real bad. <laughs> but the attitude in which they had didn't even compare to the attitude that you had. And here we are trying to teach our, teach our kids, you can't have attitude while we have attitude. Amen. And we can move into it any moment. We can be standing in the kitchen washing dishes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy oh, name. Who left this in the sink without rinsing a doubt? Get in here!
We can be driving down the road listening to worship music. <laughs> God, you're so good to me. You've always been so good to me. I say it for eternity. God, you're so good. God, you're so merciful. I mean, I do that while I'm driving. That's why you should drive us out. Just praise and magnify God. If I have to pull this car over, somebody is going to be sorry. God, you're so good. <laughs> we begin to define ourselves. We have the key to soul shit soon. I'm talking about the dog, my boy. <laughs> and and, and he's, he's just adorable. We've had him for almost 14 years, and he's just a, a, a lover. And, and so we'll be saying, oh, he's so cute. And all of a sudden, he'll just do something inappropriate. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you begin, ah, I'm taking him to the path. I know. Act like you're innocent, because if you laugh, everybody's going to know you're just like me. <laughs> but understanding that what the world wants to do, not just the enemy, but what the world wants to do is to redefine who you are and try to just make you like everybody else. But you're a chosen generation. Yes, God's called you to do something greater. So quit being defined by your family. Quit being defined by your finances. Quit being defined by what other people have said to you and about you and what you think other people have said about you. Quit being, you don't, I, I, I'll take a little rabbit trail there for just a second. Do you know a lot of people leave the church over something that was never actually said or what somebody said that somebody said that somebody said about them and they believed it? Yeah. Happens all the time. Yeah. Really? Quit being defined by those things. And be defined by what God has for you. And who God says you are. And God tells you to step up. Then quit being afraid of what everybody else is going to think. What everybody else is going to say. It's not their call. It's not their anointing. It's not their life. God has called you to something spectacular. Good Lord. Oh no. Nobody says a clock. <laughs> I just had a mini stroke right there. <laughs> I have reached almost to a clock. <laughs> I know it felt like a you, but it didn't feel like it to me. <laughs> I know some of you thought I was done 30 minutes ago. Listen to this. God wants to do something spectacular in your life. Something that can carry you through the rough times. But you may think you've got some great friends and you might. But evidently Jesus knew what he was talking about when he said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Evidently he knew that other people would. Evidently he understood that some people wouldn't always love you and wouldn't always agree with you and wouldn't always be there for you. That's why I said, I promise I will. If we're going to be the people God calls us to be, we will be like Jesus. We'll be there. No matter what's going on, we will be there. We'll listen to God's voice and we'll go forward. As we've gone through a lot of awesome things over the last 13 years, almost 14 We've seen people healed, hundreds saved. You know what the great news is? I don't want to even be defined by that. I want to be defined by what God's doing tomorrow. Amen. By the changes He's making in our lives. I want to be defined by how many people we're feeding that aren't getting food. I want to be defined by how many people we're loving that nobody else wanted to love. I want us to be defined by how many people we're willing to walk up and hug and, and, and pray for and, and, and take care of their needs that nobody else would do because they didn't fit into the mold. They couldn't look like everybody else. They couldn't act like everybody else. Yeah, there's always the upper crust of the church. 
that wants to be with me. Bob Harrington, another evangelist, defined what the upper crust is. How many of you know what the upper crust is? The upper crust of the, of the church is the crumbs held together by their own dough. And so, I don't know about you, I don't have enough dough to hold myself together, so I'm not the upper crust. <laughs> but I know what God's calling us to do. And I know what God is saying about you, that God says you're capable of doing more than what you think you can do. You're more than a conqueror. Don't be defined as a back row Christian that always has to be in the background someplace that God will never use. Now I'm not talking about sanctuary back row, I'd be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> My life won't run fast enough and that door sticks sometimes and you can't get out of it, so I'm very careful about what I say. But quit allowing everybody else to define you. God will speak to you about who you are. The most important thing, He's already said. You are the righteous of God in Christ Jesus, and you are more than a conqueror. You are going forward. You are going to do great things. And you know what? You don't, just so that you know, it doesn't matter who's with you and who ain't. As long as you got Jesus, you don't need nobody else. Amen. As long as you're listening to his voice, no matter what comes your way, you can stand your ground. Remember, define and redefine who you are in Christ. And allow God to move you to that next level. Allow God to, you might be, you know what, I'm, I'm going to close with this, but a whole lot of people, because you've defined yourself as something, the Bible says that the words that we speak are life and death. And so we can speak life or we can speak death. And so we've spoken those own words about ourselves and therefore... It came to pass because you have what you speak. And so we need to begin to speak. I'm more than a conqueror. Begin to speak even whenever I don't feel good. Lord, I don't to, it, it's not a bad confession to say I don't feel good. You can't lie to God. I mean, you can, but it doesn't work out. But it's okay to say, Lord, I don't, you know, I don't feel good, but I know that by Jesus' stripes I'm healed. Lord, I may not have everything that I need right now, but I know that you have everything that I need, that my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. I know God is going to take care of me. Define yourself by the words that you speak, who you are, and everything that God is doing in your life, and watch as things begin to change. I promise you. Turn to somebody and say, things are getting ready to change. They're getting ready to change for you. For good and not for bad. God is for you and not against you. God wants to see you raised up and healed and, and, and everything that you have. God wants the very best for you. Now would you stand to your feet as we pray. Father, I thank you for your word that is a lamp to our feet and a light to our pathway. I thank you that you have blessed us with every good and perfect gift. And Lord, as we stand in this place, both as your servants and as your representatives on this earth, we submit ourselves to God right now. I'm going to ask for your heads bowed, your eyes closed, and no one looking around for just a moment before we pray. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I'm not sure that I'm saved, but I want to ask Jesus into my heart. And I'm going to wait for a moment, but if that's that you just raise your hand and put it back down. We'll pray before you go that anybody else does. Now I want to ask you this. Before we get to communion. If you're here and you say, Pastor, I've allowed other things and other situations to define me. And today it changes. I will not be defined again except by what God says about me. If that's you, would you raise your hand and put it back down in this place? Thank you for your obedience. Father, I pray right now for those that raise their hand, Lord, that you would give them the holy boldness that they need to redefine themselves. To have the courage and the strength to stand up in the face of everything else that's going on. And to know that you're doing a great thing in their life that goes beyond what they can see or feel or think or imagine. I speak over them right now that they have the mind of Christ. That they are able to grasp the width and the breadth and the height and the depth of the love that you 
Maria ma da te oggi ho con la fortuna of God in this place I declare only that they have ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying in their heart and in their life I put a hedge of protection around the bound hill in the name of Jesus that no blind manipulating spirit will be able to deceive them in a making them think that they are anything different than what you call them to be that they will not be swayed by family or friendships or money or even by church but they are only moved by the voice of God and I seal it in their heart right now in the name of Jesus now while you're still standing I would ask if possible that no one leave the sanctuary unless it's absolutely necessary because this is a sacred time. We want to show God respect and the honor. The Bible says that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he gave it. And he said, this bread is my body that's going to be broken for you. Then likewise, he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new and an everlasting covenant. This is your redemption. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And so as you take this communion today, I want to ask you to remind yourself of everything that God has said about you. And it was for you that He died, He was buried, He was resurrected, and in one of these days He's coming back again. Every time we take this meal, it's not a formality in this church, that's why we only do it once a month. Because we want it to be real, we want it to mean something. Not just the motion that we go through, but every time we take this we're remembering that Jesus died for us. That we have been redeemed and bought with a price. And you are worthy this morning. There's not a person in here that is not worthy to come to this table. So I'm going to ask if you would, as the ushers leave you, if you would come get your communion, take it back to your seat and hold it and we'll take up it together. Would you come to the table that God has prepared for you?
that night that Jesus sat around the table with his disciples and then he broke the bread, he knew what was getting ready to happen. And so he gave us his disciples and then he, he told them the importance of what this was. But he also told them something else. He said, as often as you do this, I want you to do it in remembrance of me. But he said, this is so important to me that I will never take this meal again until I take it with you in my Father's kingdom. That means that this meal has never been celebrated in heaven yet. Only on earth is it celebrated. But one of these days, we're going to gather around and the Bible calls us a marriage supper of the Lamb. So we call this the rehearsal dinner in this church. And every time we take of this, we're looking forward to that day that we sit around that table. Not with Jesus, but with all those others that we have a million questions with. With James and John and Paul and Silas. I want to hear about that earthquake story all over again. Of those loved ones that have gone on before us that the Bible says that we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses that are cheering us on and telling us that you're closer than what we think. And the table has been spread. The banquet table is ready. And one of these days is going to call us home and we'll take this meal together as one humongous family. But today we take it just as our family of realizing and admitting and confessing that Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. And he sits at the right hand of the Father interceding for you and I. Isn't it great that we have an advocate with the Father, which is Jesus Christ, sitting there interceding for us? This has been from the Old Testament to the New. But in the Old Testament, when the death angel was passing over, God made a covenant. He said, when I see the blood, I'll pass on over you. Today, when the enemy tries to come at your life, he might be able to throw arrows at you and cause them doubt and fear and all those things. But when he sees the blood that's been applied to your life, he has to back up and leave you alone and go on his way. So would you take with me the body of our Lord Jesus Christ? And the blood poured out for you for the remission of your sins. Now for just a moment, still with no one moving if you would, let's just thank you for all that he's done for us. Lord, we thank you for the blessing but for the redemption and the healing in our bodies and in our spirit. Lord, that you have called us by name and redeemed us by choice. That you loved us and you do love us. And we give you praise because you're such a mighty God and you're so worthy of all the praise and the glory and the honor. And we give you that praise right now in Jesus' name. Now I'm going to ask you one other thing. If you would be seated for just a second. We just wanted to do one extra thing, and I don't have a microphone up here that works other than mine. I got a We are so honored that not just the adults went out and fed the homeless and did all this, but these kids, our teenagers, were praying over homeless people. Both times, not just last week. And so, if you're over 18, you're probably not going to get recognized today, so don't get your feelings hurt. But what an awesome experience has been to see our young people, even our little kids from children's church, going out and handing out meals and loving on people. And, and just, what an awesome thing to teach our kids. Amen. What an awesome thing to see happen. And so, Roger and Tina have, have been with us, and so they prepared some little certificates of appreciation for our kids for helping us so much. This doesn't mean you're out meets with but see you again Tuesday night in the rain when we do this again. So, Robin and Tina, if y'all want to come up and... Okay. 
that's fine for moms. That way, those watching by the internet can't hear you. Jesus' name, the church said, Amen. Amen. Love on one another. 